Good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to talk about the Book of Ether today. If you'll get the Book of Ether out, it's in the Book of Mormon, right after Mormon, and right before Moroni. Uh, the Book of Ether, anybody want to tell me what's different about the Book of Ether? It's not the same old thing, is it? It's, it's something different. In, in fact, if you were going to... Um, Say, for example, that you were a charlatan who wanted to be a prophet and you were going to make something up. About the last thing you'd do in the middle of creating a whole record that was supposedly of the people on the American continent is in the middle of it, create another one that takes place in a completely different geographical setting in a completely different time. Uh, but that's exactly what we do. And, and the reason that it happens, uh, I think, uh, or at least commentators seem to agree, that um, we remember that we have Mormon and Moroni who are redactors, our editors, and are creating this record, and there's a purpose that they're creating it for, right? They're creating it for generations that will come after. Now, if we look back at Nephi when he began the record, he seems to be speaking to a closer group. He's speaking, he feels that his descendants are going to get something out of this. Um, at the end of this record, where Mormon and Moroni take over the redacting of the record from about 117 pages in, when Nephi's record, which is pretty much all in his voice, stops, and Mormon, starting with uh, Mosiah, he, he starts telling us the story. And when he gets to the end, Moroni takes over and tells us the end of it. And... Um, they, at this point, have a, a totally different perspective, don't they? They're 400 years after Christ. They've been through all these terrible wars. The whole civilization has gone downhill. And they now don't have too much hope that anybody in the near future is going to have any interest in this. And they are writing to us, whom they call the Gentiles. Um, they are writing to the people who will come later when they understand that this record is going to be hidden away somewhere, and they know it will come forth later. And so they're writing, they say, as if they were speaking from the dust, they're writing to generations ahead, where they hope that people will take this record seriously. So the tone that Mormon and Moroni have is completely different than, and the, kind of the focus than Nephi has. And in the middle of all of this, Moroni stops. Is it Moroni or Mormon who stops? And now I, Moroni, the Book of Ether, verse 1. And now I, Moroni, proceed to give an account of those ancient inhabitants who were destroyed by the hand of the Lord upon the face of this north country. So they're up in the north country, and he's talking about the people who lived up there. There were 24 plates that King Mosiah found that were with all the records. Limhi and Mosiah, you know, they looked through all these records. And there were these 24 plates. I take mine account from the 20 and 4 plates which were found by the people of Limhi, which is called the Book of Ether. And as I suppose, then he says, now the first part of this record is all about the creation of the earth and Adam and Eve. And he says, I suppose the Jews have all that, so I'm not going to put that in. Don't you wish he'd put it in? Because he, we would have had um, a, a, a purer account. He says, I'm not going to put that in there. But I am going to put the part in from the Tower of Babel on down. And so this is a group where the Tower of Babel, where all the languages were confounded. This is the record of a group of people whose language was not confounded, and they were able as a group to move away into the wilderness, and they have this adventure. They have this big experience. He begins very traditionally, as all epic literature does, um, this is uh, a piece of epic literature, just as the Book of Mormon is, just as the Bible is, and, and there's a very um, definite style to it. And it almost always begins with some talk about the creation of the earth and then a genealogy of the group that we're talking about right now. So you can see at the beginning of the Gospels, they do it. Way back at the beginning of the Bible, in the Old Testament, they do it. And here at the beginning of the Book of Ether, we have a genealogy, if it, as if it matters to us. You know, we... We skim these things, but, but that component says this is an official record. This is a part of the epic story of a civilization. 
And so boom, 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 we have the genealogy, and that gets me all the way to verse 33. Verse 32, Kib was the son of Oriha, who was the son of Jared, which Jared, now we get to Jared, came forth with his brother and their families, everybody with me, chapter 1, verse 33, with some others and their families from the great tower at the time the Lord confounded the language of the people and swore in his wrath, that's the Lord, not Jared, that they should be scattered upon all the face of the earth, and according to the word of the Lord, the people were scattered. Now, the interesting thing here that happens is that Jared is supposedly the leader of the group, but his nameless brother, who, who um, later uh, Joseph Smith said that his name was Mahanrai Moriankmer, right? Um, but his brother is the one that's got sort of some, a kind of a spiritual connection to God. And in fact, in just in these first two chapters, seven conversations between the brother of Jared and God are recorded. And almost every single one of them is instigated by Jared. He says, now will you go back and ask him this? Now will you go back and ask him that? Um, he just has complete faith in his brother's complete faith. So let's talk about these conversations and what happens in these conversations. So now we know who the Jaredites are, right? Seven conversations with the Lord. The brother of Jared, verse 34, being a large and mighty man and a man highly favored of the Lord, Jared, his brother, said unto him, cry unto the Lord that he will not confound us that we may not understand our words. So the first request that Jared has for his brother is what? What does he want not to happen? Yeah, so go ask the Lord if, you could, if we can keep our language. So he goes and he asks the Lord a series of things. And um, I, so I made a little chart here of some things that I think we learn about prayer from the brother of Jared. He, um, and, and just sort of as these conversations roll out, I, I think that you'll see some of these. I actually took these from a website uh, that I found where just somebody who didn't say what his name was was talking about what he learned from prayer from the brother of Jared. I thought it was wonderful, and I would give him credit if he'd mentioned his name. Uh, first of all, he appears to be very patient about it. He will keep going back to the Lord about these things. And there's a one thing that it always says in, in this account, and that is that every time the brother of Jared prays, the Lord has compassion on him. And I think that's kind of neat. Uh, Elder Holland says there must be something about the way this man approached the Lord that just touched the Lord's heart because he just couldn't refuse him anything. Um, the brother of Jared uh, cries to the Lord and the Lord had compassion upon Jared. I ended up just underlining all the times he said that. Therefore he did not confound the language. So he gets the first thing he wants. Then Jared sends him back crying to the Lord again. It may be that he will turn away his anger from our friends. This reminds me of Abraham, right? Where you have a negotiation take place where he says, please don't kill my brother Lot and, and his family when you take Sodom and Gomorrah down. And, and he says, well, okay, well, and, and you know, would you spare the city for 100 righteous? Would you spare the city for 50 righteous? Would you spare it for one righteous? And so you have these men of such faith that they get into a negotiation with God and God will enter into it. He's, you know, he, goes, he goes into it and says, I, I'll deal with you. And, you know, let's see, let's, let's see what you can do here, little pray, pr praying person. Um, and so he cries unto the Lord again. The Lord has compassion on him, and so the friends and the families are not confounded. And then, verse 38, go and inquire of the Lord whether he will drive us out of the land. And if he will drive us out of the land, cry unto him where, whither we should go. <laughs> and who knows, but the Lord will carry us forth into a land which is choice above all the earth. In other words, if he's going to drive us out, could we go to a nice area? You know, <laughs> could we please not go into a desert, you know, the Gobi Desert? No. Could, you go, could we please not have to go to Nevada? Could we please go like someplace really nice? And um, I mean, I understand that I've gotten to the point where I won't drive anymore across that desert. You know, I, I meet Craig, I fly, and he takes the car. And so, I, I understand the brother of Jared. I don't want to go to this horrible area. Don't, don't send me to Mesquite. Um, please, you know, let us go somewhere with trees. And so then, it came to pass, verse 39, the brother of Jared did cry unto the Lord that had been spoken, and the Lord did hear and had compassion on him. 
and said unto him in verse 41, Go to and gather together thy flocks, both male and female, of every kind, also of the seed of the earth of every kind, and thy families, and also Jared thy brother and his family, and thy friends and their families, and the friends of the friends of the friends, you know. And when thou hast done all of this, you go at the head of them, down into the valley which is northward, and there I will meet thee, and I will go before thee into a land which is choice above all the lands of the earth. And now we have the promise of Abraham in verse 43. There will I bless thee and thy seed, and raise up unto me of thy seed and of the seed of thy brother, they who shall go with thee, a great nation. And there shall be none greater than the nation which I will raise up unto me of thy seed upon all the face of the earth. And all of this because this long time you have cried unto me. I think that's very touching, that it really does matter to him how much effort we put in on this. Um, and this business and how much effort we put in on prayer is kind of our theme today. So chapter 2, it came to pass that Jared, is such a good story, we just need to read it. It came to pass that Jared and his brother and their families and the friends of Jared and the brother and their families went down into the valley which was northward, and they named it after the hunter Nimrod, showed this, they had the, the uh, Bible, the Torah, with their flocks, which they had gathered together, male and female of every kind. So they have flocks, and they have stones, and they had snares, and catch the fowls, and they had fish of the waters. And here comes the, the, the uh, symbol of Utah, verse 3rd, verse 3rd, third, third verse. And they did also carry with them Deseret, which by interpretation is a honeybee. And I think this is where it turns up, isn't it? I mean, I think this is where we get it. Um, Deseret books, Deseret industries, Deseret this, Deseret that. And all those cool little beehive uh, carvings in the beehive house that Brigham Young did. They did carry with them swarms of bees and all manner of that which was upon the face of the land, seeds of every kind. And it came to pass that when they had come down into the valley of Nimrod, the Lord came down... Conversation number four. I have a number four by this verse in verse four. And talked with the brother of Jared, and he was in a cloud, and the brother of Jared saw him not. So the first three times, there appears to be a voice, and this fourth time, we're getting a little closer, and the Lord is in a cloud. Came to pass in verse five that the Lord commanded them they should go forth in the wilderness into that quarter where there never had been men. And the Lord did go before them and did talk with them as he stood in a cloud, once again very like the Israelites who follow the Lord who is in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And it came to pass that they did travel in the wilderness and they built barges. So these are like the, the first barges they built and, and they're, they're getting good at this uh, type like unto a dish concept. And they did cross many waters, being directed continually by the hand of the Lord. And the Lord would not suffer that they should stop beyond the sea in the wilderness, but he would that they should come forth even to the land of promise. Now, there's all sorts of people who spend their whole lives going around the world trying to figure out where these things took place. And um, I don't know why I'm not very interested in that, but people need to be interested in that. Some people are super interested in that. Uh, but one thing that we do learn from good old Hugh Nibley that I read about this are two things. One is that um, there are shallow seas. There were much bigger shallow seas than there are now. So in some of these areas in the, um, in the third world and also on this continent, there have been larger bodies of water that were shallow that over time have shrunk. So when they talk about a shallow sea, that's what we're ta talking about. And also when there's so much wind... Um, Hugh Nibley talks about the burans, the, the, the winds in the Asiatic continents that um, are so bad that there's certain parts of the world where people don't even go outside at four o'clock in the afternoon because the winds are so bad. So that wind becomes a big issue um, in this chapter. And it's also symbolically a big issue because there are floods and water in almost every great epic tale of literature. And there are winds and the winds um, represent the storms of life. Um, uh, it may not be on the mountaintop or over the stormy sea. The, the winds that blow across the sea and that blow across the desert are a great symbol of the, the um, vicissitudes of life. So once again, God uh, in 8 has sworn in his wrath unto the brother of Jared that whoso should possess this land. And this word wrath um, I don't think it means that the Lord is violently angry, but that he is passionate about this. That's how I interpret this word. Um, in other words, he really means it. 
that whoso should possess this land of promise from that time henceforth and forever should serve him, the true and only God, or they will be swept off when the fullness of his wrath, here's the wind, should come upon them. Now we can behold the decrees of God. Now who's talking right now in verse 9? It's Moroni. So we're back. Moroni's talking. Um, he's telling this story, and he's, and he's abridging it way down. And let's talk about, just for a second, the difference between Moroni and Mormon as an editor and as a narrator. Um, if you want to go back and watch Mormon tell, I mean, you want to go back to the stories and just watch how Mormon tells them, as opposed to the way Moroni tells them. Mormon is a little like, he reminds me sort of like of Matthew in the Gospels. He's very interested in saying, here was what got prophesied, and here's what happened, and I'm just going to mention to you that that fulfilled that prophecy. He likes to tie it up. He's one of those kind of people who is very, um, he's literally totally believes in all of this, and he wants to show you in a very inspiring way the way these prophecies are fulfilled. Moroni, on the other hand, Grant Hardy makes the point that Moroni seems to be a little less um, concerned about that. For example, he has an opportunity, for example, to say about Coriantumr, who comes later in the Book of Ether, that um, certain, certain things are prophesied and then they exactly happen. But Moroni doesn't take the opportunity to say, see, that happened exactly the way it was prophesied. And there's two or three times when, if it were Mormon, he'd tie it up for us. But Moroni doesn't. What Moroni does, the only thing he seems to have faith in anymore is that God will convert us. We're not going to get converted by seeing how the prophecies get fulfilled. It's Moroni who says, when you shall receive these things, have a grateful heart and ask God if they're true. He doesn't say, when you shall receive these things, I want you to notice how all these prophecies got fulfilled. He says, when you shall receive these things, if it be wisdom in God that you ever get them, I want you to remember how the Lord has blessed you, and then you ask him, and you get converted, because he is a witness to the most stark reality of everything being destroyed. And he, all he can do is have faith in what's coming in the future. So it's kind of interesting if you want to go back and just sort of take a look at, there's a very different style in the way Mormon tells a story and the way Moroni tells a story. Um, very, hard to, very hard to create that if you were writing this book, but if you were translating two different real people with different voices, it comes across as two very distinct individuals. So Moroni tells this story, and he can't help it. He has to stop and sort of preach to us for a few minutes. And so from 9 to 13, he says, um, you Gentiles, I just want to let you know this is a land choice above all other lands, and here's what's going to happen to you if you don't keep the commandments, because I've just been watching it. And in verse 13, he sort of shakes himself and says, and now I proceed with my record. Whoops, I, you know, I sort of went off track there, and I just, I just felt like I had to talk to you about this. In verse 13, it came to pass that the Lord did bring Jared and his brethren forth to that great sea which divides the lands. And as they came to the sea, they pitched their tents. They called the name of the place Moriankomer, hint, brother's name. And they dwelt in tents and dwelt in tents upon the seashore for the space of four years. And um, the great phrase in the book of Nephi, and my father dwelt in a tent. Once again, you have people who have been probably prosperous. They have left everything. And it's kind of a shock. I mean, if I went and dwelt in a tent, I'd mention it a lot. <laughs> a lot, right? Even if Andrea has to go capping and be in a tent one night, I hear about it, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and so people who are not used to dwelling in tents really mention, for Pete's sakes, we were dwelling in tents for four years, it says here. Verse 14, and I have a number five by that. Here comes conversation number five. It came to pass at the end of four years that the Lord came again unto the brother of Jared and stood in the cloud. So now we have this cloud come down. And this is not the fun one. For the space of three hours did the Lord talk with the brother of Jared and chastened him because he remembered not to call upon the name of the Lord. How would you like to be chastened for three hours by the Lord? I think it says something about the strength of Jared that he survived that. And the brother of Jared repented of the evil which he had done. I don't expect he was a very evil man. Don't, I, don't you kind of get from the brother of Jared that he's just a doer? 
I mean, he's just a, he's a guy that gets stuff done. It says about him, the Lord says to him, now go to work. And it says, and he went to work. And when we get to the 16 stones, he may be the only guy in the scriptures who thinks that up the solution to a prayer. He's so interesting, but he's a doer. He's a guy that just goes and gets stuff done. So I'm just figuring that over these last few years, he'd just been getting stuff done and hadn't been spending so much time in prayer, right? And um, I really like that about him uh, because he also is able to incorporate into his life this great um, prayer skill that he seems to have developed. And this is something I would like to develop because I'm pretty good at doing. I'm not great at praying. Um, I, I'm just sort of like, okay, you know, you know. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go now. And, and that's about as good as my prayers get. And so I... I I'm really touched by this. The brother of Jared repented and did call upon the name of the Lord for his brethren who were with him. And the Lord said, I will forgive thee and thy brethren of their sins, but thou shalt not sin anymore. And here's another very famous phrase. Remember that my spirit will not always strive with man. And we've all seen this, haven't we? We've seen this with our children and sometimes with ourselves, where you'll really be, really be wrestling with the Lord about something, and then you sort of give up on it. And, and he won't pursue it if you don't pursue it. If you will sin until you're fully ripe, you'll be cut off from the presence of the Lord. That's, that's the Lord's view of free agency. He, he won't force you. And I like this. And these are my thoughts upon the land which I shall give you for your inheritance. I mean, how cool would it be if the Lord said, these are my thoughts about this, you know? I just love that, this, this conversational. The fact that this is a conversation is just really touches me. 16, and the Lord said, go to work and build after the manner of the barges which you have hitherto built. So I taught you how to build these barges which got you a little ways, and now I'm going to have you build one that's as long as a tree. And the brother of Jared did go to work and his brethren, and they built barges after the manner which they had built according to the instructions of the Lord. So once again, there's a nice prayer lesson there. In other words, the Lord may give you some little things that you feel inspired to do, and then that ends up not being the, the big answer. It just ends up being the thing that prepared you to do the next thing. Um, and then we have this great verse 17, where tight like unto a dish is repeated five times. And they were built after a manner that they were exceedingly tight. How tight were they? Even that they would hold water tight like unto a dish, and the bottom was tight like unto a dish, and the sides were tight like unto a dish, and the ends were peaked, and the top thereof was tight like unto a dish, and the length thereof was the length of a tree, and the door thereof when it was shut was, see? We've got it, don't we? And so verse 6, it came to pass that he cried unto the Lord. And I said verse 6. I mean verse 18, but I have a number 6 next to it because this is the sixth conversation. He cries unto the Lord and says, I have performed the work which thou hast commanded me, and I have made the barges according as thou directed me. And behold, O Lord, in them there is no light. Whither shall we steer? And also we shall perish. He's being a little overdramatic here because I think he knows that the Lord would not actually have them die, but you know, uh, for in them we cannot breathe, save as the air which is in them. Therefore, we're all going to die. You know, what are you going to do about this? And now the negotiation begins. Well, before the negotiation begins, I thought we might just talk for a couple of moments about some of these things on this slide. Um, the brother of Jared, uh, patience and persistence. First of all, all of these blessings come to them because of this long time thou hast cried unto me. So I'd just like to ask you to share with me, um, how, what's, the, what's the longest you've ever prayed for something? Maybe you don't want to share it with me, but maybe you just want to think about it. What's the longest you've ever prayed for something? And, and, and how, how do we know to keep on praying for something? The question that comes to my mind is if I keep praying for something and it never happens, Maybe I'm praying for the wrong thing. How do we know to keep on praying for something when it never comes to be? What's, I mean, how do we judge? What should we pray for? Yes? Righteous desires. I don't think you can ever stop praying for your righteous desires. How do you know they're righteous? I would hope that you would prayerfully. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> no, that's good, yeah. And, they, and usually righteous desires are, are usually for other people, aren't they? I mean, you know, they're usually just like things that seem selfless. Now, sure, yes, Janice. Praying for our erring children. We pray for our erring children, for our children who wander, and that's a prayer that um, Heavenly Father still has, doesn't he? He says, why should I not weep, seeing these shall suffer? If he had anyone to pray to, he probably would be praying for his erring children. He's, he's, the, the buck stops with him. Yes, so there are certain things that just go forever. Yes? Well, um, for me, it was serving a mission, coming home, and my boyfriend who I had written on my mission had, I'd come home and he had a girlfriend. And so it was devastating for me because we had this plan. So, yes. um, <laughs> for and it seemed like a righteous plan. I was upset. I was like, I did everything. I'm doing everything right. And then I started dating someone else. We were engaged three times, broke that off. And I was, went to the temple one day and I was just pleading with the Lord. And in my mind, I could, and in my heart, I could feel that um, he was telling me to be patient. There's something greater that I have in store for you. And so that's what kept me, kept me going and being persistent and trying to do what was right. And um, you know, so I just had to put all that behind me and feel the love of my Heavenly Father and know that things were gonna work out in His time and in His way. Okay, so now you have to tell us how the story ends. <laughs> So I met my husband, um, my, this boy who I dated five years after my mission. Um, I just never felt right about it, but I just kept thinking he's righteous and he's a return missionary and we're working with the MTC together and it's just perfect. Yeah. And, um, so I just never felt right about it and then I was set up on a blind date. I, was teach I had graduated BYU, got my tuition back because I had graduated without getting married. Just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and um, I was set up on a blind date. And I'd never gone, a, I, was, I said, I will never go on a blind date, ever. But I, at this point, I was kind of like, okay, let's do it. I'm 27. And, you know, living in Provo, that's... Yeah, that's age <laughs> that, of the Yes, yes. Oh, so I was, okay. teaching, I was teaching in Provo at Tempe High School, and a teacher there set us up um, on a blind date, my, my husband and I. And, um, wow. And the other boy was coming back to try to get back together with me. He was from Arizona, and he was on his way. I mean... Driving oh, this on way. I let, we could do a movie. I know. I just, I told my husband, I'm like, you saved me. But anyway, um, yeah, so we met, and four months later, we were married. Well, I totally understand. Now, it, for those of you who are in the back and didn't, couldn't totally hear that story, that is, I love that you tell me that story, because this is what our lives are like. You know, we're not leading a group of people across the wilderness, but a lot of times we're in the wilderness trying to figure out what to do next. And um, you had a plan, you went and did everything that God said, you went on a mission, you had this nice person that you were going to marry, you came back and he had somebody else. And so the plan's all messed up. So you say to Heavenly Father, I'm going to perish. There's no air in this vessel. There's no light in this vessel. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to perish because I had this whole plan and you have not done your part, Heavenly Father, because I'm going to perish now. And so... Heavenly Father says to you, what would you like me to do about that? He might be saying that to you. In other words, you just need to be patient. You need to go to work. You need to just go on with your life. And um, I had much the same experience, you know, became an, uh, after two engagements, you know, that just kept not happening. I just couldn't feel right. You know, I just went on, left BYU, went on to work and just felt like, Obviously, I'm not going to be a person who ever likes anybody enough to marry them, and I'm just going to just keep going on like this forever. And it's very interesting that it's when we let go like that and we just, just get into the flow of life and just say, I'm going to stop telling you what needs to happen. Uh, I'm just going to go forward one step at a time. Uh, and then you met your husband, your wonderful husband, that uh, I, we know that worked out beautifully. And thank you for sharing that. So many of us have this happen to us a lot. Um, uh, another thing we learned from prayer about, from the brother of Jared about prayer is, um, 
that we should pray in good times and bad. In other words, when they got sort of to a place where they were safe, brother, the brother of Jared just sort of went to work and started living and forgot to pray in the intense manner that he had before. And for that, he was chastened. This happens to us all the time. And so that's the nice thing about the sacrament and other things like that is that they help us humble ourselves and remember to pray. Now, there's this great line that comes when we get into the negotiation about the 16 stones where the brother of Jared doesn't say, oh, Lord, I think you can do this. Oh, Lord, I, there's a lot of evidence that you can do this. He simply says to God, you can do this. I've got these things. I know you can do this. And um, in response, the Lord, they have this remarkable experience. So let's read about the 16 stones. And as we read about the 16 stones, I'd like you to think about something that you want from God right now. Um, we usually have decisions that are fairly hard to make. My husband and I have made hard decisions all during the course of our lives where we'll think, do we move somewhere? Do we buy this house? Do we have another child? Do we start this company or do we sell it? Or do we buy this piece of property and in, or invest in that? Whatever, where we're putting either our livelihood or our health and well-being on the line about a decision. And over the many years, um, we've come up with a little bit of a phrase that we call being engaged to a decision. Um, we, we, Pretend like we gave that decision a ring and we start making plans to get married to it. Um, in other words, we start making plans to commit totally. We start getting the pictures taken and having the shower. We just start moving forward with that decision before we're totally committed to it and we see how we feel. Uh, and that has been useful to us. And I, this is what I see the brother of Jared doing in this situation. So let's, let's talk about the 16 stones. No light, we're going to perish. And so the Lord says in verse 20 of chapter 2, unto the brother of Jared. Oh, I wanted to stop. This is fun. Um, this is a nice quote I just wanted to share with you. This thing about praying always, it says, if prayer is only a spasmodic cry at the time of crisis, then it is utterly selfish. And we come to think of God as a repairman or a service agency to help us in our emergencies. Do you treat him like that? I do, kind of. And we should remember that the Most High, day and night, always, not only at times when all the other assistants has failed and we desperately need help. I like that quote from Howard W. Hunter. I think I've really gotten an appreciation for Howard W. Hunter as we've looked at him uh, through our Relief Society lessons and so forth. He's a, a marvelously insightful man. So I just, I just kind of wanted to... Uh, this, is not, this is not the idea about prayer. So the Lord says unto the brother of Jared, make a hole in the top and a hole in the bottom and you can breathe, okay? And you can stop it up. So, but then he says, I have done as thou commanded and I've got the vessels ready, uh, but let's get back to the darkness part. And in verse 23, the Lord says, what will you that I should do that you may have light in your vessels? So, balls in your court. Behold, you can't have windows. Here's all the things you can't do. For they will be dashed to pieces, neither can you take fire with you, for you will not go by the light of fire, obviously, because you're like a whale in the midst of the sea, and you're going to be turning upside down, so a fire's just not going to work. And I prepared you against all these things, the waves of the sea and the winds and the floods. Therefore, now that we have all of these parameters of what we can't do, and I've created for you an almost insoluble problem, what will you that I should prepare for you? He gives him a little hint. What will you that I should prepare for you that you may have light when you are swallowed up in the depths of the sea? And that ends the chapter. Chapter 3. And it came to pass that the brother of Jared, now the number of the vessels which was prepared were eight, went forth unto the mount, which they called the Mount Shelem because it was really high, and did molten out of a rock 16 small stones. And they were white and clear, even as transparent glass. And he did carry them in his hands upon the top of the mountain and cried again unto the Lord. Now, um, transparent glass, I'm guessing he found some kind of crystal, huh? And it would have been pretty hard to make 16 of these. I, I went out in my little... Uh, where I have some smooth stones uh, in, a, in a little flower bed area, and I picked the whitest ones I could find, and none of them are transparent and clear. You, it, you don't go around and just find transparent, clear stones. 
he molted them. In other words, we're talking bellows, we're talking um, making some kind of a crystal object. Um, and he made 16 of them. Did it take a month? Did it take a couple of months? I don't know how long it took, but it, this is a big amount of effort. And I was talking with my daughter Allison about this yesterday on the phone, and she said, okay, let's, let's get in his mindset on the fourth stone and the fifth stone, you know, where there's a lot of work, and maybe some of them don't work out. And he's thinking, how many of these do I have to make? I, I know I gotta make 16 of them, and what if I get all the way to 16 and it doesn't work? But he does it. He goes up on the mountain and says, cries unto the Lord, saying, you said that we must be encompassed about by the floods. Now, do not be angry with me because of the, my weakness before thee. I know that you're holy and, you know, just trying try to make sure he doesn't get smitten. But you did tell us to call upon you, so here I am. You know, it's like he's a little nervous. He's been chastened before and he knows how bad it can get. He said, oh, Lord, three, thou hast smitten us because of our iniquity and has driven us forth. These many years have been in the wilderness. Did I mention the tents? Nevertheless, thou hast been merciful unto us. O Lord, look upon me in pity. This is very sweet. And turn away thine anger from this thy people. And suffer not that they shall go forth the raging deep in darkness. But behold these things which I have molten out of the rock. And this sounds very Japanese to me because um, the Japanese way of being humble is that you speak of your children as things. Um, they're the things in the house. You would never speak of them as children. That sounds too elevated. Uh, you say uchi no mono, the things in the house. And um, you always speak, uh, you lower yourself when you speak. And when, if you give somebody a gift, you hold it above your head. And so I see him like this, saying, I made these things. I don't even know what to call them. But here they are. I know you have all power and you can do whatever you want for the benefit of man. Therefore, touch these stones, O Lord, verse 4, with thy finger and prepare them that they may shine forth in darkness, and they shall shine forth unto us in the vessels which we have prepared that we may cross this sea. Behold, O Lord, thou canst do this. Um, the, here's what er, Elder Holland says about this beautiful line. For all of his self-abasement, the faith of the brother of Jared was immediately apparent. In fact, we might better say transparent, in light of the purpose for which the stones would be used, obviously Jehovah found something striking in the childlike innocence and fervor of this man's faith. Behold, O Lord, thou canst do this. In a sense, there may be no more powerful expression of faith spoken in Scripture. It's almost as if the brother of Jared was encouraging God, emboldening him, reassuring him, not, Behold, O Lord, I'm sure thou canst do this, not, Behold, O Lord, thou hast done many greater things than this, However uncertain the prophet was about his own ability, he had no uncertainty about God's power. This was nothing but a single asserted declaration with no hint of vacillation. It was encouragement to God, who needs no encouragement, but must surely have been touched by it. Behold, O Lord, thou canst do this. And so when you said about our righteous desires, that we pray for them and that we just keep praying for them, he's an example to us. This is how long we keep on going. We just keep on going. We just keep saying, behold, O Lord, Janice, you just keep saying, thou canst do this. I know you can do this. I know you're more powerful than the adversary. You can bring my children back. Now you just show me where I need to get the stones, what I need to do. I'll do the 16 things, whatever I can, if you will touch it with your grace. And so this is uh, kind of where I get with this story, and that is if we're talking about getting a prayer answered, um, how much are we willing to do, and how creative and pragmatic and, and um, assertive are we willing to be in order to get a prayer answered? Um, I, you know, a lot of, we may pray and put a name in the temple and do that kind of thing, but are we willing to do 16 things? So that's why I got to the Brother of Jared's Guide to Dating. For example, if we have a child or a grandchild or ourselves who may be single and we say, I'd like a companion. You know, I, I, I want to get married or I want to get a better job or I want to uh, have a better style of living or I want to have my family be closer together and not fight so much. Whatever is the thing 
that's in our way. So now Cindy's going to come up and be my scribe. So let's pretend, just so that we don't get too close, because most of us are not dating, but we have kids and different things who are. So let's do a guide to dating. Now this girl is saying to this guy at dinner, it's hard to read, and she says, you should never bring your cell phone on a date, especially if it's smarter and cooler than you are. Let's just say a few spiritual things this young man could do, and Cindy will write them down. If he's, if he's here, he's in the young single adults, and he seems not to be able to get to the state where he's going to get married, what spiritually do you think he needs to do? Just shout him out. Honor is calling. Do your church calling. How many young single adults do their church calling? They don't very much, right? Because they're they get very self-focused. What else should he be doing? Honor his priesthood. He should be honoring his priesthood. He should be exercising his priesthood. Um, and in order to do that, he's got to get rid of something. And what's that? Whatever sins he's hiding. I'm going to say secret sins. Got a little pornography going at night, see watching crummy, crummy shows on television, whatever. Whatever nobody knows about, we got to get rid of that stuff because that's just part of life. You can't be worthy unless you're actually worthy. And what else spiritually might he do? Anything else? Just yeah. The basics like prayer and scripture study. And yeah, let's just write basics. Just get the basics. Okay, that's four. That's one fourth of our 16. What's the next column there, Cindy? Temporal. What's this guy need to do? I think this is very interesting in the church that people don't think about the temporal when they get married. They seem to think it's just all a spiritual thing. In the old days, I read a lot of Victorian literature, you didn't even think about getting married unless you could actually what? Support a wife. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. So not, yeah. And maybe even, you know, so education, right? Let's get education. Make sure he's got enough education. And I think even rather than job, let's say career. And this is men or women. Uh, we, there's nothing less interesting than a woman who's waiting around, who's doing some kind of podunk job and just sort of waiting around for a man. You like a woman that you've got to chase down. She's got so much going. You know, there's a real famous story about, you know, some guy talking to his grandfather about, you know, I don't seem to be able to get married, and, and uh, he, they're hunting, and the dog, he says, have you noticed a dog won't chase a dead duck? <laughs> you need to be swimming, right? You need to be swimming. What else temporally might you might do if you want to be married, man or woman, that, that you might need to do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, in other words, temporally, Live in a nice place. In other words, get yourself in a situation where somebody might look at you and say, well, that's nice, you know. Uh, my sister was widowed, you know, right after she was married, and a few years later she met a young man, and, and she kind of liked him, and then he bought a home, and he took her to go and see it. And she said, I remembered that day walking through the house with him, and for the first time I could visualize we could have a life together. You know, he's taking steps toward making a place where my daughter and I could have a home. So um, temporally, you might think about that. What else temporally might you do? Hmm? I mean, just home. Just say, like, make where you live. In other words, uh, a lot of young single adults just camp until they're 29 or 30 years old, you know, and you'd think, take a step forward. Take a step forward and create. Yeah. Move out of your parents' home. Yes, move out of your parents' home. Independent. Let's write independent. Uh, because that's the other thing. Um, my brother Steve and I were laughing because he, he takes care of my mother and he is, you know, and I said, Steve, do you think you'll ever remarry? And, and, and he says, well, I, I think it would be hard for me to say I'm 66 and I live with my mother. <laughs> but, you know, God bless him, he's taking care of her right now. But uh, it, it, it is a, it's a situation where you have many who have simply a failure to launch. You need to launch. And so if you have young people in your family who say, you know, I keep praying and God doesn't send me a mate, you say, okay, well, let's talk about some 16 stones. Okay, what's our next category? Physical. Okay, physical, this is good. What do we do? Makeover. A makeover. Just right, makeover. You have to say this with a Scottish accent in order to get the rhymes, you know. Um, 
Because if you say, oh, the grace that God would give us to see ourselves as others save us, that doesn't work. So you have to say, oh, the grace that God would give us to see ourselves as others see us. And then it rhymes. That's Robert Burns. And that's so true. You need to get somebody who isn't trying to hurt your feelings, but at the same time loves you enough to tell you the truth and say, how do other people see me? Um, I really felt when I was 23 and 24 years old that um, if young men couldn't appreciate somebody who was a little bit overweight, it was their fault and they didn't have the spirit. And life being what it is, men are attracted and women are attracted to each other physically or they're not. And you have to do the best you can with what God gave you to be attractive physically or I think we're going to get held accountable later because uh, we're not doing our 16 stones because we can say, you know, those people just didn't have the vision to see the inner me. And God will say, yeah, well, you didn't have the vision to give up the donuts. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like you kind of got to get real about those kind of things. And um, you need to make it not quite so hard to see the beautiful spirit within. Another thing we might do physically is what? Yes. I don't know if this is between temporal and physical, but like I feel like the generation that's coming up, they can't put their phones down, they can't make eye contact, they cannot have a conversation. I yes. don't know where that fits in. Yes. Like teach them how to be real people. I yes. Gonna I'm going to put that under emotional, I think, but write that down. So, so, um, interpersonal. Yeah, in other words, and manners, um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, it's getting really bad. Um, back to physical, what else do we say about physical? Yes. Clean. Clean. Um, yes. Hair, body, car. Uh, one of the things that my husband, who has hired many hundreds of people over the years, uh, when he was younger and he, and he was trying to learn how to hire people, one thing that he used to do was walk to, out to their car with them after he'd interviewed them. And it was just, there were so many people who knew why, never knew why they never got a second call. But he'd walk out to the car, and if it looked like a trash bin, he thought, okay, this person is not going to be able to organize all of the things that they need to organize to succeed. It, they don't care enough about that. It, it just was an indicator to him. And um, I, I think just cleaning up yourself and your space. I, I always... Um, you can find out if you have bad breath. You can find out if you don't smell good. But a lot of us don't ever try to find that out. Um, it's, we just hope we don't. Um, I think it'd be really important to not only be clean, but smell good. You know, we can't all be beautiful, but we can all smell good. That's a thing that we can just do. You know, even people in Europe could if it mattered to them more. And so... Um, what else physically can we do? Yes. You can be confident. I think <clears throat> ah. a lot of things in the church, just from the culture, is like, and this is for married or for people who aren't married, but there are so many amazing people. Sometimes we lose our confidence because we're comparing ourselves to other people. It was so interesting to watch a friend of mine who um, actually started going to a graduate program where a lot of people were members of the church, and for the first time she was dating people outside of the church, but she was upholding her standards, and she was really confident for the first time in attracting men for the first time in her life. And I think that God wants you to feel confident. He wants you to feel good about yourself, especially when you're married. You know, you have to feel confident in order to maintain your marriage and your mm -hmm. relationship. And so I think that's a, a big thing with our physical, like, confident yeah. in whatever we are, you know, however we look. Let's get our posture up and just stand. Yes, Eleanor. I think just exercise. Yes, exercise. Let's write that down. You can kind of tell when someone takes care of their body. Mm -hmm. And I think just exercise comes with maybe like being interested in the outdoors and just constantly finding reasons to go out and just use your body and be happy. That kind of yes. goes along with it. That's right. And build, just building those things. Okay, so let's final. Uh, just in terms of emotional, we have manners, we have etiquette, we have um, not bragging. In other words, not being self centered. Um, how many people do you talk to, and I'm probably I'm one of them, who just talk about themselves? And in other words, how, when you talk to someone and they take a genuine interest in you, how wonderful is that? Um, some of these real 
interpersonal skills. Uh, when I went on a mission, rather than a Mormon doctrine, my mission president gave every single person who came into the mission field Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And he made us read it and read it over and over again. He said, no one will ever listen to the gospel unless you know how to relate to other people and take an interest and have a conversation and listen and have manners. And he goes through all of those things. And so all of those kind of interpersonal skills, sometimes we spend so much time talking about fasting and prayer, we stop talking about looking someone in the eye and shaking hands and taking an interest in other people. And finally, emotionally, I think that um, I would just write down something like get help. Because most people have some things that are holding them back emotionally, that are, are getting in their way. And um, we should take some steps toward trying to solve those things. So thank you. There are just some 16 things. Now, if we'd have been talking about getting a better job, or if we'd been talking about having another child, or if we'd been talking about another big decision you might make in your life, can you see how there might be 16 things that you might need to do? Um, I just think it might be worth thinking about what are my 16 stones right now? What are the things that I need to do to get God to give me what I want? Um, that's really um, touching to me to think that um, there are so many things that we could do. Uh, once again, this beautiful thing. Obviously, Jehovah found something striking in the childlike innocence and fervor of this man's faith. Oh, Lord, thou canst do this. Um, that this just touched the Lord's heart and that he felt that this wonderful man, the brother of Jared, who really is a wonderful man, um, he finds his way into the Lord's presence. So let's conclude by seeing what happened. It came to pass when the brother of Jared in verse 6 had said these words, the Lord stretched forth his hand and touched the stones one by one with his finger, and the veil was taken from off the eyes of the brother of Jared. And he saw the finger of the Lord, and it was as, as the finger of a man, like unto flesh and blood. So he fell down, and the Lord says, why have you fallen? And he said, I saw your finger, and I thought you might smite me, because remember, you chastened me before. And the Lord says, you have seen that I will take upon me flesh and blood. There's a huge doctrinal component here that w when our faith grows, our ability to understand past, present, and future grows so that he sees what the Lord is going to look like after he's born. He said, otherwise you would not have been able to see my finger. Did you see any more than this? And here's this wonderful man. He says in verse 10, no, show yourself to me. What courage is that? He loves the Lord. And the Lord says, Believest thou the words which I shall speak? And he says, I know you speak the truth. Thou art a God of truth and canst not lie. Takes us right back to Alma 32, doesn't it? Where we start with belief, just desiring to believe. And that turns into faith. And that turns into knowledge. And in this case, he has the knowledge before he has the evidence. He knows. And so he sees. And the Lord says, Exactly this in verse 13. Because thou knowest these things, you are redeemed from the fall. Therefore, you are in my presence, and so I will show myself to you. You're redeemed from the fall. You're already in my presence, so I can show myself to you. That, that's just beautiful to me. And then he explains who he is, and he says, I've never showed myself this way before because no one has ever come to me with this kind of faith. And he says in verse 17, Moroni steps in and says, I, Moroni, I am going to tell you that Jesus showed himself unto this man in the spirit, even after the manner and likeness of the same body, even as he showed himself to the Nephites. And this may be one of the reasons this is here. And because of the knowledge of this man, he could not be kept from within the veil. The brother of Jared seems to have thrust himself through the veil, not as an invited guest, but not as an unwelcome guest, but he was technically uninvited. And so in other words, his faith was just so great, he, he went past the plan, and he gets invited into the presence of the Lord. Wherefore, having this perfect knowledge in verse 20, he could not be kept from within the veil. Therefore, he saw Jesus, and Jesus did minister to him. 
And this beautiful chapter in chapter 2, where he then goes on to have a vision like that of Enoch, Maybe one of the most beautiful chapters in the scriptures because I think it gives us so much hope that ordinary people like ourselves can have really extraordinary things happen to us if we take these steps of faith. So it's my prayer and my testimony to you that if you have a prayer in your life, this has inspired me to make a little list, certain things that I just pray for and I just keep praying for like a hamster on a wheel. And I just, did, I just made a little list and I thought, I'm going to step off the wheel a little bit and I'm going to actively do a few more things. Maybe I'm going to write a letter. Maybe I'm going to um, expand my reach to try to care for other people's children who need me uh, in hopes that the Lord might send people to care for my children when they are in need. There might be things that the Lord might inspire me that I can do that simply because I haven't gotten to work yet haven't come into my heart. I pray that as we pray, we'll take a lesson from the brother of Jared and not only pray, but find ways to take 16 stones to do more things to help it make it easier for the Lord to answer our prayers. And I leave this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.